great, this is a big week. This is the week where we all get to take a nap. And then we go out and shop till we drop. Woo! Uh, my name is John. Thanks for being here for the beginning of the holiday season just about. Does anybody already have their Christmas trees up? Anybody? Oh, wow. <laughs> we don't like you. Uh, <laughs> but you're the people who put on that Mariah Carey song, All I Want For Christmas is to shut up. I mean, we're just not ready for it yet. No, we're thrilled that you are here, and we love you. I love this church. Um, hey, do me a favor. Pull out your smartphones really quick. Let's turn off the ringer together. Uh, turn off the ringer so that later, if we're praying or doing something holy, you know, your ringtone doesn't go off. And then um, we can do something fun. Open up Facebook. Check in to Life Church Saginaw on Facebook. You can use the hashtag, I love my church. And that's what we've been on this journey in November, sharing about the five things that kind of make us unique, that make us different. We're only a six-year-old church. Have you ever been around a six-year-old before? I've got five kiddos, love them. But at age six, they're kind of in that weird, awkward stage. They're kind of going to kindergarten by themselves, but still making huge messes, running around naked. And, I mean, that doesn't happen at Life Church. <laughs> if you're new here, no, that's not, we're not a cult. Um, actually, if, we're, if you're new, do me a favor, fill out that blue connection card. It's on your seat. If you didn't have one on your chair, just steal one from your neighbor and uh, fill out that blue connection card, drop it off later. we got a gift bag for you. Uh, but, but yet we're only six years old, and, and yet God has just shown so much favor to our little church. We, we are one church in three locations right now, Midland, I was just there, and Zoomed here, and, and then Bay City, they just worshiped at 10, my friend Meg and Sherry shared the same message, and now here we are in Saginaw, and we're just trying to figure this out as we, we go along, we're in this together, and, and so that's why we're reminding ourselves of why we do what we do, what makes us different, because the holidays are coming, Everybody goes to church at the holidays, even your irreligious Dwight Schrute of a co-worker has a to-do list, and one of them is to check off the box, I need to go to Mass. And so our thinking is, why not invite them to a healthy, vibrant community where it's okay to not be okay? And so that's the journey that we're on, trying to figure out what does it look like to be a light a matchstick in the darkness. That's what we want to be this holiday season. Uh, you're putting lights on the Christmas trees. We want to be a bright light. I, I mean, I just want to be like Batman, because uh, what guy doesn't want to be Batman, number one? Um, but to have that big bat signal, I mean, that's what the local church could be and what it should be. So uh, just a quick review of what we've been talking about. Um, we said in week one that found people find people. So we looked at the scriptures, and yep, that's how Jesus brought together his group, found people, find people. And next week, we're going to start talking about Christmas here at Life Church, and we're going to make it super easy for you to invite, to find people to bring with you, to come sit with you. The first thing we're going to do to make it easy is we're going back to our old worship times, of 10 and 11.45 here in Saginaw. There's one woo. That was the 10 a.m. person. I like to get up at 10 a.m. The rest of us are like, I barely get here at 11.15. <laughs> and there's a couple reasons why we're doing that. Number one, um, last week we broke fire code by a lot. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> So there's that. We don't want you to die. And then also, <laughs> listen, if you're a new guest, you're, you're, I mean, you guys all are like, hey, it's full. But, but first time guests don't like it to be full. They, they don't like long lines for the restrooms. They don't like parking in the grass. They don't like, you know, checking their kids into a, a place where the kids are hanging off the ceiling. <laughs> So we're going back to our, our 10 and 11.45. So if you used to be 10, if you could slide back to 10, that'd be awesome. I'm going to be here with you all December. And then if you're 11.45, praise Jesus, bring someone with you, and we're going to rock out. It's going to be great. And we're going to live stream the 10 a.m. to our Midland and Bay City locations. That's how we're going to do it in December. Um, 
And then uh, for Christmas, we're talking about Christmas, you know me, there's a Star Wars movie coming out. <laughs> and we are that church. So if you're new, here's the deal. A couple years ago when we started the church, it was in 2015, the, the Force Awakens, the first big Star Wars movie in a generation came out. And so I was like, guys, I got a crazy idea. And they're like, oh no, too much coffee for the pastor. I'm like, what if we got a, a, a private premiere of Star Wars and we gave away tickets and... You know, you had to come to church and put your name in a hat, and, and so we did it, and we ended up in Time Magazine online, and USA Today, and the Washington, I mean, if you go Google Michigan Church Star Wars premiere, you'll still see us online, it went viral, and that's where we saw a lot of people come to church for the first time, and discover a fresh new relationship with Christ, um, we, we even saw people who are now, like, high-impact Serving, but like if you've been at Life Church for a while, you know we have this amazing singer who's up here sometimes named Roderick Pritchett. Roderick discovered our church through the Star Wars outreach. The first time I met him and his wife Sally was in the lobby after the movie at the movie theater. He's like, "Your church?" <laughs> you know, this big black guy is awesome. I love him. I love this guy. And I'm like, "Uh, yeah, who's the pastor?" I'm like, and he's like, come here. He's like, I like this church. And, 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 you know, years later, he's here leading us in worship. And so you have no idea what God might do through you. And, and every time we've had a private donor who stepped up to, to pay for the outreach. So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, affect our pocketbook. So basically, you invite someone next week. They fill out their connection card. We take names out of the hat. They win tickets to a private premiere. And you can enter also if you bring a fresh time guest. That's how it works the next three weeks. So that's going to be fun. We'll have some lightsabers in the front lobby. And it's going to be nuts. So found people, found people. Uh, number two, we said that sage people serve people. I think we got some slides for this. Sage people serve people. So we talked about you're never more like God than when you get down on your hands and knees to serve someone. Sage people serve people. We have amazing volunteers we're serving right now are our, our infants and our children. Last week, I sat down in Life Kids and, and watched it, filmed it from beginning to end, and I was just in awe of these adults. Uh, it's so easy to serve in Life Kids. You basically press play, and I was just like, wow, this is the best hour in a kids week. I love this. And, and so getting involved at, at our church is as easy as lifechurchgrow.com. Week three, we said, I cannot outgive God. That's where we threw the M&Ms. Remember that? Remember all that chocolate we ate? That was a good time. <laughs> so, you know, like, <laughs> Got a cavity that day. So we, we talked about that. And then um, Growing People Change was last week. And my friend, our former next-gen pastor, Christian Arm, was up here. How many here were here for that? Wow. That was, that was something special. We put that whole thing online and on our YouTube channel. It's been shared over and over and over. Because um, he just went to a real honest and raw place talking about heartache. Wars and the hope of the gospel, and uh, man, there are people that it was just Niagara Falls. It was amazing. If you missed it, go on our website, lifechurchmichigan.com. Check that out. And so today, uh, we're going to wrap this up before we go into Christmas. Um, I want to talk about light. You remember growing up? Did you ever have a fear of the dark at, at nighttime? Your, your grown up would tuck you in, and then the lights would go out, and that's when all the scary shadows appeared. I've got this four-year-old, and he still is struggling with staying in bed at night. He's, he's got this huge fear of the dark, and so I've got night lights everywhere. Our light bill is through the roof. This poor kid, he just is afraid of the darkness. And, and we see so much darkness in our world. That's why I love Matthew chapter 5. If you've got a Bible or a Bible app, flip to Matthew 5 really fast. Jesus gave this huge message on the side of a mountain, I've been there, it overlooks the, the Sea of Galilee. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, he says these amazing words to you and me. He says that your lives, you, your lives, light up the world. Let others see your light from a distance. For how can you hide a city that stands on a hillside? And who wouldn't light a lamp? And then hide it in an obscure place. Why would you hide a nightlight? That doesn't make sense. Instead, place the light where everyone in the house can benefit from its light. And then Jesus said, so listen, don't hide your 
light. Don't hide your light. Let it shine brightly before everyone as you do these things that bring positivity and bring the gospel into the world. Let your light shine so that people will see it and give praise to your Father. And the essence of this, what Jesus said is, you, you, you are the light of the world. You could be a little matchstick in the darkness. You may be a flashlight flooding in the camping. You may be a Batman bat signal flooding Gotham City. You are the light of the world. And this was written in ancient Greek, and there's two Greek words in this phrase I want to show you. The word you, he says, you are the light of the world. He uses the Greek word humeus, humeus, which means you. <laughs> it means you, like individually. And so Jesus is speaking right to every individual. You are uniquely made in God's image, and you have great potential with your life, with your influence, with your riches. You are the light of the world. That word light he uses is false, false. And that's where we get the word for photograph, for photography, meaning an exact imprint, an exact image. You are the light of the world, so you are the image of Christ. That's what the word Christian means. It started in Antioch in the book of Acts, chapter 8, chapter 9. They were little Christs, little lights. And, and, and so photography, think about, not, not, um, not like your iPhone photography. You remember back in the 1900s? <laughs> Remember way back when we didn't have instant photography and, you know, you go click, can you take it to Walgreens? Remember the Polaroid camera? I'm a child of the 80s. Anybody else 80s, 70s? Take me home. Come to Rome. And you'd have these Polaroid cameras and you'd say, smile, everybody smile. We get one shot at this click and then it comes out and, and you have to wait because it's wet and you have to shake it. Shake it like a Polaroid picture. You know, and, and so <laughs> it starts out kind of fuzzy, and then slowly it, it becomes this beautiful image. And, and that's, that's the question for us. If Jesus says that you and I, this Christmas season, are the light of the world, we are supposed to each be an imprint of, of God in a body, Jesus, right? We're supposed to do good works. We're supposed to change the world. Is our image, is it a reflection of Jesus, or is it something fuzzy? Are we crystal clear that, that, that we're an agent for good, or when people look at us, it's, it's kind of like, it's still the wet Polaroid. I was at Target the other day, because uh, they don't sell Polaroid cameras anymore, and I went to Target, and, and they just started selling Polaroids as like this special, <laughs> fancy feature, and it has to do with Stranger Things. Do you know how much they're selling them for? Like over a hundred bucks oh for a camera that was in, in the 70s doesn't apply to the sermon. I'm just saying. Uh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> so, so what does your image look like? What does your thoughts look like? Because light is good for two things. Light reveals truth and it exposes darkness. Light reveals truth, exposes darkness. In John chapter 8, Jesus picks up on this idea of light. And he says, I am the light of the world. Jesus, God in the body, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness will have the light of life. And so sometimes people go, okay, wait, who's the light? Is it Jesus or is it me? It's both. So think of sunlight. Think of the, the biggest star, the sun. And, and it brings life-giving sunlight to our planet. That's Jesus. Everything revolves around the sun. He gives life. He brings light into the darkness. And you and I, we're like the moon. The moon can't generate its own light, but it reflects the life-giving God light. Is that what you're reflecting in your life, in your conversations, on what you post online? Because for some of us, something gets in between the moon and the sun. A large celestial being called the planet. And what does that do? It blocks the sunlight from reflecting off the moon. It's called a solar eclipse. And so here's a question. Are you experiencing a spiritual eclipse? For some of us, Thanksgiving and Christmas are not happy experiences. It may bring up thoughts of 
attacks from the past, wounds, an empty chair. And so I want you to know that as we enter Christmas this season, you are loved here. And we're going to do our very best to be sensitive to everyone's experiences while pointing to the hope we have in Jesus. Because that can cause a spiritual eclipse. You know what else can cause a spiritual eclipse is just apathy, just getting distracted. And my hope today is to get you to laugh a little, to give you a little bit of hope, to put a skip in your step, and maybe even to challenge you as we wrap up this I Love My Church series, because we want to look at what's getting in between me and the sun. What is it that's getting in between the two? Today's message as we wrap up our DNA series, I Love My Church, it's simply this. You can't do life alone. I can't do life alone. You can't do life alone. We are in this together. And we is greater than me. We is greater than me. I can't do life alone. Alone. Even Jesus, the Son of God, God the Son, didn't do life alone. He even assembled disciples. He said, let's go change the world together. Nowhere in Scripture will you find an example of a lone ranger Christian. Your faith is always personal but never private. And if you try to isolate yourself, you're going to experience a spiritual eclipse. That light is not going to hit you because you and I are designed for community. We need each other. We are better together. I can't do life alone. So if you've got a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 5. I want to go old school this morning and just take a few minutes to look at the earliest church. Because that's our heart at Life Church. Six years ago, we said, let's strip away all the man-made traditions that have popped up in the last 2,000 years. Let's go back to the Bible. Let's go back to God's Word and, and simply do what it says. The Word of God is powerful. What you have in your pocket, what you have on your nightstand, that can change the world. It is the battery for your light. And I think a lot of us were intimidated by the Scriptures. We don't know where to start. And so we just let it sit there and we observe it and say, yep, that's my family Bible. Oh, that's really nice, doesn't it? It is a nice looking Bible, but we never open it up. But when you hold the Word of God, I mean, you are holding God's voice. You are, you are in the presence of God the Creator. And so if I love God, I want to hold the Word of God. Like, I love my wife. I don't want to just look at my wife. I want to hold my wife. And so that's the same thing. If you love God, you want to hold God next to you and allow the Holy Spirit to, to make things pop out to you and to speak to you and, and feed your soul. And, and Christmas is a great time to begin reading the Bible. You just open up to the Christmas story and just start reading along. And eventually Jesus came and Jesus rose from the dead. You guys got Disney Plus? Oh, sweet Jesus, that's amazing. <laughs> The Mandalorian is rocking my world. If you've not seen it, um, you're missing out. I, I love the Lady and the Tramp stuff. Um, I, I love all the Disney movies, the Pixar stuff. But here's the cool thing. They've got National Geographic, and there is a special you need to watch. It just came out in the past year. It's called Inside the Tomb of Christ. I've been there in Jerusalem. What they did was they sent some scientists in to fix the church that's built over the cave of Christ, and you need to watch it. It's 45 minutes, it will rock your world, because the earliest Christ followers in the book of Acts, they changed the world in their generation, not because of a book. They didn't have the Bible. It was still being written. They changed the world based on an event. A dead man rose from the grave. And Jesus said, I am God. I am the light of the world. Come follow me. And they began talking about Jesus to everyone in Jerusalem. And by Acts chapter 5, this little small movement of 120 people had blown up to about five or 6,000 people. And it says in Acts 5 verse 13 that the believers were united. They were wonderfully united on the same page as they met regularly in the temple courts, in the area known as Solomon's Porch. Here's a picture of the temple as it would have looked 2,000 years ago. 
Pete, Jim, and John are leading this little movement, the mega church. They don't have a building. And they figured out that all of their Jewish friends worshiped God at the temple on Saturday, the Sabbath. And Sunday morning, it was empty. Sunday morning is the day that Jesus rose from the grave. And so the earliest church moved to the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And they would gather there at the temple where they would worship and proclaim the word. Worship and the word. Every Sunday they met regularly. Temple courts. That's where they invited their friends and their neighbors. Come and see. This is what you're looking for. And that's why at Life Church, we put so much emphasis on the weekend worship experience. Worship and the word. You were designed to worship something or someone and the word is what feeds us. In fact, we say this a lot. Don't go to a church that feeds you. Go to a church that makes you hungry. And that's my heartbeat. And so Acts 5 says that they would meet in the temple courts. And then here's what happened a few verses later. It, they simplified things in the early church. Instead of having a Juanus and vacation Bible school and the men's group and the women's group and all these things, they just narrowed the focus. This is what was normal in the earliest church. It says nothing stopped them. They were unstoppable. Their light was flooding all the dark tracks of the world. And they kept preaching in the temple courts, and they kept meeting from house to house. Temple courts, house to house. Temple courts, house to house. So let me bring it into where we're at in 2019. At Life Church, we narrow the focus. We do temple courts. That's this. Worship the Word in Midland, Saginaw, Bay City. Why three locations? We want to make it easy for people far from God to experience the best hour in their week. Like, my deal is this. I believe that Jesus is God, the Bible is true, and hell is hot, forever is a long time. I want to make it hard for people in the Great Lakes Bay region to go to hell. I want to be the church that has a bumper sticker that says, Hell? No. Hell no! That's our church, okay? Please be with you. Um, I want to make heaven crowded. That's my deal, man. I just want to reach people who never go to church by creating the best experience possible. I can't change their hearts, but I can control the environment. So I want the I want to bang instead of doing vacation Bible school one week out of the year, I think every stinking Sunday should be vacation Bible school. All that money, all that time, all that sacrifice that you put into one week. That should be happening 50 Sundays a year. Yeah. It really should. And, and, and the, the worship, that's what we're designed for, man. If we can create an irresistible environment of undistracting excellence, and the music is what's going to grab the hearts. And then the word is just the cherry on top. That's just making Jesus famous, pointing people to Jesus. So, so Sundays is where we begin. And we create a place where people feel like they belong. So we grow in wit on Sundays, but we grow in depth through life groups. Because that's what the early church did. That they grew in width on Sundays. They put people in rows. You're in a row. But then they grew in depth by doing life together in small groups. Circles over rows. Circles over rows. Because in a small group of 10 to 12 people, number one, you get to eat. You like to eat? I like to eat. Some of y'all are fasting right now. You need to stop that fast and eat in Jesus' name. We like to eat. So imagine if for eight weeks you went to someone's house and you get to eat their food. <laughs> that, should, that should be our tagline. Life groups, go to someone's house and eat their food. Um, you go eat, you just talk about your week, and then you end in a prayer, and that's it. They weren't, you know, they're not doing deep Bible stuff. They're doing life together. That's where accountability develops. That's where trust develops. Our church is growing so dang fast. People say to me all the time, they're like, hey, where is so-and-so? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know which campus I'm at half the time. I don't know. There's a lot of sheep. And we've discovered if we can herd the sheep into smaller groups, doing life together, sharing highs and lows together in a safe atmosphere, sheep grow. Spiritual journeys grow when we're in smaller groups. If someone's missing, it's the small group that will notice. If someone's hurting, it's the small group that will reach out and take care of them. There's a reason why churches in America average 60 or 70 people. Because they hire somebody 
the senior pastor, and they say, you do all the work, senior pastor. You open the doors, sweep the floors, make the photocopies, change the diapers, give the sermon, visit the hospitals. You do everything. And that poor person can only deal with 60 or 70 people. And then it gets bottlenecked. And we don't want that to happen at our church. Our church is healthy. And so the way that I can show that I care is to develop systems of care, of life groups, and it's in the Bible. If I can herd some of you to try a group just for eight weeks, easy on, easy off, imagine what God could do through you with weekly encouragement, weekly prayer, people who know your name and not just a face in the crowd. See, if I try to do it all, I mean, I, I would love to, but I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to be very effective and I'm going to have a heart attack one of these days. It's just not going to happen. You can't do life alone. And that's why maybe your next step is to try a life group this January. Maybe your New Year's resolution beyond, you know, getting the gym card. I'm going to lose weight. Yeah, you are. Um, <laughs> it is to try and take a step of faith and register for a group. Maybe it'll work out. Maybe it won't. It's only eight weeks. to we give you an escape clause. Our website, lifechurchmichigan.com is where you can go to begin that journey of trying a life group. And I would love it if you try one. That'd be a great New Year's resolution. You may develop some new friendships. Did you know that when a first-time guest goes to any church, in order for them to stay at that church within six months, they need seven meaningful friendships. And the senior pastor cannot be one of them. Seven meaningful friendships or else they will leave the church within six months. That's you. You actually are serving the vision of the church when you step out of your comfort zone and join a life group or start a life group. Because new people need relationships. We can have an amazing band and amazing preaching and amazing kids ministries and stuff, but that just draws people in. That's gravity. Relationships are the glue. That's why Jesus did life with 11 guys and one of them betrayed him. <laughs> so it's not perfect. You can't do life alone. What if you went to our website in the next several weeks and made it your New Year's resolution? And then it's an easy jump to say simply, I can't do this church alone. You can't do this church. We need each other. We are stronger than me. And in 1 Corinthians 12, we are the body of Christ. So nobody is expendable. Nobody gets tossed to the side. If one part person is hurting, the entire body is hurting. It's through life groups that we see healing and serving one another. That's where we do mission work in our neighborhoods. You don't need permission from me to go serve. Just go serve. Get your group together. Go. Go serve. That's what the early church did. That's Acts chapter 5. And, and that's our simple rhythm here at Life Church. So 2019 is coming to a close, and it's just zoomed by. Anybody get to that stage of life where it's just like, what you like? I can't believe it's it. I'm thinking about last year. I used to make fun of those people, and now I'm that guy. You know, I'm in my 40s. I just turned 42 on Friday, and uh, I read a science report this last week, and it says there's a scientific reason why as you get older, it feels like the days and the years go flying by. It says because your brain slows down, <laughs> your synapses don't fire as quickly as when you were in your 20s. And so you're taking less memory in, less photography into your brain. And so when there's less, it, then when you think about your past year, you have less memory. And so you feel like you've gone through a time warp. Isn't that interesting? Right? That's science, right? And so I'm like, that makes sense. I'm going brain crazy. That makes sense to me. <laughs> I'm still stuck in last year. Because this year has just been like, <sighs> kids are getting older. Grass is growing taller. And becoming like Clint Eastwood, get off my lawn, kids. You know, our church is growing. You know, we're the 11th fastest growing church in America. It's like we just woke up one day and we're like, what is, you know, when things are changing fast, it just, your head is spinning. And this year, I just feel like I've been on this, I don't know, maybe you feel this way too. You're just like on this treadmill of life. And it gets to Thanksgiving, you're like, where did the year go? You know, I kind of look back at the past year, and there's things I'm excited about, like seeing all the life changes past last Sunday in this space, 13 people prayed to receive Christ. Just incredible. Yeah. We, we baptized almost 50 people this calendar year. We broke the baptism tank, and so, but somebody donated a new one. We're just getting it cleaned up. It's a huge one. 
If I look at the year, I see all the celebrations, but then I also go, but man, I just feel like, huh, I just kind of feel worn out. Anybody else ever feel that way in life? I'm just being real. Okay, Christian got to be real and raw last week. My turn. It's my turn. <laughs> no, I mean, I love my church, but I'm just like, oh my goodness, this pace, you know. Uh, it, we did 707 on Wednesdays with the teens, and we saw lots of fruits, but that was another night out of the week. And then we got Monday nights, and things were happening there. And then Sundays, I'm driving everywhere to all these campuses, and I love what I do, but I'm just like, I'm getting worn out. <laughs> Some of you are getting tired just thinking about it, right? <laughs> and, and honestly, um, I'm just like looking at the past year of ministry and, and everything, and there's so much fruit, but, but one person can't do it alone. I'm, I'm like, I feel like the rate at which I'm trying to do the work of God is destroying the work of God in me. You know, running everywhere and, and doing things, and, and, and our staff feels that way. Like we are, we are like Survivor. <laughs> our staff—it's <laughs> it's amazing. They, they kill it. Our interns, our people—they're amazing. But you know, they're human. They get tired too. And, and so this past week, we had. Um, we had a church that's over in Niles, Michigan. You know where Niles is? It's like right here on the edge. They started a church from scratch like three years ago, and they're, they're trying to break 200. So they came here Wednesday. They got a hotel room, and they just wanted to hang out with the staff and the interns and just ask questions like, how do you guys do this at Life Church? And how do you do that? Just trying to learn. And um, we had a staff meeting, and it was incredible because two of our staff people um, are, are unpaid. Like they work full time, nine to five jobs, and then on their day off, they come here and serve. And so Muta, he was the lead pastor of this church, Roland Church, he goes to Megan and Melissa, he goes, why do you guys do this? Why are you serving and working all these extra hours at church but you don't get paid? And we happened to get a little video of it, and I want you to hear this. Watch this. church, got saved, got baptized, we discovered she has speaking gifts, and this morning in Bay City she delivered the same message that I wrote to the people in Bay City, and, and she's not getting paid, I mean, that's just unbelievable, she works full time, uh, and, and this, is, this is her passion. Then there's another gal, Melissa, who just graduated with her business degree and is on fire for Life Church and saw some needs that she can meet. Watch this. And there and he's our job.
unbelievable people at this church. You guys are unbelievable. They're, it's just incredible that you're here on a Sunday worshiping God in a former golf center. I mean, it's just nuts. I mean, I love my church. And, and so there's more beyond just sitting on Sundays. You can't do life alone. Groups are where it's at, but, but even groups of people who rise up and say, man, let's, let's go even further, faster, let's reach more people far from God. And so in my closing minutes, um, in Hebrews 10, it talks about not giving up meeting with one another. And so if you're, if you're looking for a Bible study this week, why should I try a life group? Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. It talks about how we do life together and in small groups is, is how you're known and, and um, it's, yeah, it's messy and it's scary, but it can also be this beautiful thing. But what if also we saw Sunday mornings as an opportunity to be missionaries? We got a good thing going on, but what if in January 2020, we really put the pedal to the metal? And I'm not the guy, I'm just, I'm, I don't have gas in the tank this December to do like, you know, hey, let's raise a million dollars and let's put a big thermometer on the stage. I think that stuff's weird. Uh, I'm not into, uh, you know, fill out a church pledge card and let's stuff that up. I'm more of a dreamer, and, and that gets me into trouble sometimes. <laughs> but we've, we've got this amazing thing going on, and reaching people in Midland and Bay City and Saginaw and Monday nights and teenagers. But, but I'm realizing I can't, I can't do it on my own. The staff can't do it on their own. Um, and, and our volunteers who are serving, they, they need, I mean, they, they need, you, we, we are better than me. And, and if I was going to dream about the future, I would dream about two things. One, I'd dream about, and we have maybe 150 kids that we have the privilege of serving every Sunday in Bay City, Midland, and Saginaw. And that's where my heart is, because I'm, I'm father of most of those kids. <laughs> that just kind of came out of my mouth. I've got some skin in the game. i got a lot of kids, people. I and mean, you have a lot of kids, too. Like 150 kids on average come through on Sundays. And, and we're, we're doing a great job, but what if, what if, what if, it's all volunteer run right, right now. What if we had someone who had the experience and who had the education to, to take the reins as the, the kids director. I'm just dreaming out loud, and this will get me in trouble. I'm not saying we're getting a kids director. We don't, the money's not there, right, in the budget, but it could be there if some of us wanted to make it happen. Imagine how much better, how much more organized, how much more systematic our kids' areas could be at all three locations if we had someone who was freed up to focus full-time or part-time or whatever just on developing kids' workers and training and setting them up for success. Hey, our volunteers are killing it, don't get me wrong. Our interns are killing it, don't get me wrong, but what if, what if some of us stuck down deeper this Christmas season to help make that happen? We need a kids' person, we do. It's insane we have this many children. And it's all volunteer run. We need, we need more pastors on staff. I'm at right now. <laughs> and I love serving y'all, but, but you, you could be getting a lot better teaching. <laughs> you know, you could be doing a lot better. Um, what, what if... Oh, thank you. <laughs> like, yep, yep. <laughs> what, what if... I'm just thinking out loud. I'm not making promises. I'm not doing nothing. I'm just... You know, in Acts 5, it says that when there were needs in the church, they would just bring it out. And I think this is a need. We are severely understaffed at our church. Um, what if we had another pastor on staff to help with the teaching, to help with the shepherding, and someone who had gifts that I don't have with one-on-one -on -one and, and things? Um, what, what if someone like Christian Arndt were to come on staff here? Right. Oh, I'm just dreaming out loud. I'm just being real because <laughs> at the rate we're going, our staff and our interns are all going to collapse in exhaustion. We need the help. And, and here's a guy. Here's a guy who's gone through the meat grinder. And in the evangelical Christian world, he's radioactive. You know, that's that's the thing about uh, Christians. We're really good at eating our own. And, and oh, you, you're going through a divorce. Even though there's no sin issue. Oh, you're going through a divorce. Oh, you. 
untouchable, then how redemptive would that be? How redemptive would that be for someone who loves Life Church and whom Life Church loves to have a place to heal with friends and use their teaching gifts and to bring things to the table that we, we are lacking right now? How, how amazing would that be? That just never happens. That would be <laughs> I can't make any promises because uh, here's the deal. In, in the New Testament, Paul says that elders who teach are worthy of a double honor. And he talks about how you have people who preach and teach and serve, and the church makes sure that they're taken care of so that they can focus on those things. And so uh, I was just at Midland. Each campus has strengths and weaknesses. The strength of Midland is that their giving is through the roof. Okay, they they, uh, they continually keep giving beyond what, what they need to give. Their hearts are in it, man. You don't give to a church unless you're in it. And the same with Bay City. They are giving beyond what they need to give to operate Bay City. It's unbelievable. And so Midland Bay City, so your guys' challenges right now is you need to invite and serve. Invite and serve. People come to Christ because we invite them and we serve them. And so that's their challenge. Saginaw has the reverse Reverse challenge. You guys are killing it inviting. I mean, look around. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> We're pretty packed. We're going to two services next week. You guys are killing it inviting. You're killing it serving, right? Um, our our challenge in Saginaw is is trusting God with our finances. I'm just shooting straight. And if we had people who were maybe not tithing begin tithing, or people who wanted to give and beyond what they normally give, that might allow us to bring on a kid's portion that we desperately need and someone like Christian Arndt who wants to come. It's just a matter of can you be financially supported? I'm just shooting straight. So I'm not making any promises. I'm not putting a barometer up here. I'm not doing pledge cards. I don't, I don't have the bandwidth for it. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> I love you, but it's the end of the year and, and I've hit, hit the wall. Um, what, what could be? What should be? If we stepped out in faith. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. The harvest is plenty, the workers are few. What would happen? Just throwing that out there. You get in trouble for throwing that out there. I'm not making any promises, people. And what I'm saying is that God is able and God's people are obedient. I don't have an ending for the sermon, so I'm just going to close in prayer. <laughs> Listen, I love my church. We got an awesome thing going on here. Let's swing some light flavors. Let's invite some people. Let's dare to dream. And if we are going to dream it, we got to be willing to pay for what we ask for. And let's see what God can do through you.